Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5. The book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 5. We have found our way back to the letter of 2 Corinthians. Remember the Apostle Paul has written a previous letter to them in the book of 1 Corinthians. And the Apostle Paul is now having a follow-up letter to try to encourage this Corinthian church to keep their eyes off themselves and on the Lord. Remember that was their main problem the first letter is that they were so full of pride. What is pride? It's a false view of oneself. What is pride? It's when we're putting our attention on ourselves rather than our God. And now as he's hitting the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is trying to get these people to look at God, to put their attention upon the Lord. And we now come to one of the most effective ways of making sure we keep our eyes on the Lord. And it's found in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5. The book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 5. So everyone, if you don't mind, take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And notice with me, if you don't mind, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse number 1. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse number 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have not a building of God. And a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For this that we are in this tabernacle, <clears throat> do we groan, being burdened, not for that which we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for the same self thing is God, who also hath given us unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether being present or absent, we might be accepted of him. For we are must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everything that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 5? The book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 5, and if you don't mind noticing the phrase in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. And with the Lord's help, we want to preach to you from the Bible here about the judgment seat of Christ. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. A God who's worthy to be worshipped. You're worthy of our service. You're worthy of our attention. You're worthy of our adoration. You're worthy of our praise. And as we come to you knowing we're talking to a real God, a God who hears and answers prayer, we're asking that you would work in our service today, that your Holy Spirit would have liberty and that you would speak to hearts and that they would respond to you properly, that we would realize how important event this is of the judgment seat of Christ. Lord, it's so important that I do not have the words to describe it. I don't have the skills to 
portray it. I don't have the ability to communicate it. So the best I know how, I'm asking that you would fill me with your precious spirit for the purpose of you getting your own work accomplished and drawing your people to yourself. And if there's anyone at the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus as their personal savior, that today they would get things settled, that they would have that assured of according to the Bible promises and that you would have victory in their life as well. And we love you. Do a work that's impossible even now and we could trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5, the apostle Paul is now switching to the subject of death and trying to remind the people that there is something beyond this mortal coil. That beyond this time, beyond the grave, there are still things to anticipate. And in this passage, he's asking some very frequently asked questions. People are curious, what happens when I die? What happens when I give up the ghost? Do I just lay there in the dirt? Do I have a soul sleep where I go to sleep and then one day Jesus comes back and I wake back up. What happens when I die? What happens to my body? What happens to my soul? What happens in the midst of this? What happens next? You know, those are valid questions. And I'm thankful that the Bible provides answers that we don't have to hope or guess. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to fill in our own ideas. We can see what the Bible has to say for itself. If you don't mind, the first thing we want to show you as we examine this text here is the dissolving tabernacle. The dissolving tabernacle. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number one. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. So here it's using pictorial language. We know that the tabernacle is a temporary dwelling place. So inside of the Old Testament, we studied the tabernacle. It was the temporary dwelling place of God. It didn't stay in one place. It kept moving. Well, without a doubt, we know that we have a temporary dwelling place. This is not where we're going to be at forever. This is temporary. And by the way, those of you who have aches and pains and getting older, aren't you glad it's temporary? You're not stuck in this old mortal coil forever. That'd be horrible. That'd be awful eternal life. And one thing is that this earthly house, so this is of this house, so it's using pictorial language to try to describe our bodies. That I have an earthly house, this, this thing made of earthly material. When I die, my body goes back to dust, right? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It goes back to the ground. This body is temporary. It's going to fade away. It's going to fall apart. It's going to dissolve away. Some of you already feel like your body's dissolving away. It's no longer the same body you got when you first got it. It's gone through some mileage. There's things. It's dissolving away. And, and you're not as capable anymore. And it's going to dissolve away. It's going to fall apart. It's going to go away. And one day, it's going to release you. You're not going to need this forever. It is a temporary house. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know what that means? We get a brand new body. We know that the Bible puts us together that immediately after the rapture, we get a brand new body. And this is a redeemed body will not grow old. It will not fall apart. It won't feel pain. It won't have tears. Praise the Lord that this brand new redeemed body will not be able to sin against God anymore. Oh, I'm looking forward to that body. Now, this body I currently have is not the body I'm going to get. But I'm thankful that we could do anything for a little while. It's just for a moment. It's a temporary dwelling place. But I'm going to get a brand new body. Now, notice that one thing that's not going to be new is our soul and spirit. You understand? That's you. What makes you? Your soul. What is in your soul? Your intellect, your emotions, and your will. That's going with you. That's who you are. And your soul is going to get a brand new foundation, a brand new body. And I'm looking forward to that as well. John Quincy Adams, a former president, he illustrated this point well in one of his quotes. Someone asked him about his age, and this is what he replied. He says, I'm very well, thank you. However, the house which John Adams lives in is growing old. The thatch is wearing thin, and it trembles in every gale. I think that John Quincy Adams will have to soon move out, but he himself is very well, sir. 
He's falling apart, but you know what? He's going to get a brand new house. And that was something he looked forward to. And I hope that you're looking forward to it too, that in the sweet by and by, we're going to meet with the Lord. He's going to give us a brand new house, a brand new permanent dwelling that will not be temporary, will not fall apart, will not just fall apart with every gale of wind. Oh, we're looking forward to it. It gives us something to look forward to. That our true self, the soul, remains intact. Paul continues with this idea. Notice as we go in verse number two. For in this we groan. What is this that we groan in? You know what? We're groaning because this body groans. Some of you groan this morning when you got out of bed. Some of you in a few minutes when you stand up when it's over is going to groan. This body groans earnestly desiring to be clothed within our house which is from heaven. Earnestly desiring I want a brand new body earnestly desiring something. Now, some of you young whippersnappers who think you're going to live forever, you don't understand now. You're like, I don't know what he's talking about. I like my body. Well, yeah, I liked my body when I was 22. (laughs) Older and broken, uh, it's not as fun anymore. There's pain, there's crying, you wake up and come on, leg work today. I mean, us older people, they're like, oh, you're just getting old. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to not dying I'm looking forward to having a brand new body that's not going to fall apart. A brand new, that's something we look forward to. That's our hope. We've got something to look forward to after death. That should be something encouraging about. We have something to look forward to beyond this scope. Verse three. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now this is curious. For we know that we are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that which will be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be clothed, swallowed up of life. Now this is going to answer a question that many people ask. We know that this body can't go with us. It's going to rot. It's going to go to the grave. Sometimes people ask me, preacher, is it all right to be cremated? Do we have to be buried? I say, I want this thing cremated. And they look at me crazy but I thought you are a preacher. Absolutely. I don't want any leftover parts used in my new one. I want this whole thing destroyed. I want it gone. I don't want no leftovers. You know, I don't have to worry about it because I'm getting a brand new body. I don't have to worry about this because this old one is going to fall apart. Now, I understand the principle that some people like the idea of burial and the actual burial because they get to see a semblance. They get to see the shell of their loved one. But may I remind you that if we had a funeral here, we'd have a casket and the person inside, we would say that person's dead. That word dead means separated. That means their shell is here, but what makes them them is separated out. They're gone. They don't feel anything anymore. Now, again, we want to be respectful, and we always are. I, as a chaplain, I deal with death all the time. I understand this. We're always respectful. But I was talking about me. I want cremated. I want done. I, I don't want any leftover parts. Now, I say that in jest, but you guys are understanding what I mean right now. That this, this body, it's going to fall apart, and it's not going to be used again. God's not saving parts for later. It's, it's gone. Brand new parts, a brand new body, brand new everything. But I don't receive that body until the rapture. Now, there may be, if things continue as they were, a time that you die and a time before you get your brand new body. Often the question is, is what do we look like then? That's a good question. Are we just floating blobs of gas? What are we? Well, the Bible answers this, not in a complete way with full of details, but it gives us enough to understand. Verse number four, so that if being so, if so be that being clothed, we should not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, for we would not be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now, those two verses, all it is saying is that you are going to get a temporary spiritual heavenly body when you're in heaven until you get your brand new redeemed body. That's just simplicity what it's saying. Doesn't give us more details. Doesn't say what it looks like. Doesn't say how old we are. It's just saying that you're not going to be a big floating blob of gas. By the way, you don't look like a baby with um, halo and wings and stuff like that either. 
The Bible doesn't say, but it, we could trust God that he's going to clothe us in a way that's pleasing to him. That's going to be a temporary until we get a brand new body. He's got something prepared for us, something that's not going to hurt. Praise the Lord. Something that's not going to feel pain, but until I get my brand new redeemed body, and we're looking forward to that. And we get a brand new redeemed body in the rapture. Notice if you don't mind in verse number five. Now he that hath wrought us for the same, 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 ah, Hold on. Verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The word earnest is the same idea that we would have as a financial thing, that if I was to buy a house, they would ask for earnest money. That means I need to give them money ahead of time to prove that I am honestly interested in purchasing this. This isn't just something I'm saying. I'm I mean it. And so because I mean it, I give an earnest, I give an earnest payment. Well, God has given us a promise that it starts off with bad news that because of my sins, I deserve to be separated from a holy, righteous God. I deserve to be separated from him. Just like a body. We would have a body here. Their body is left over and their soul is separated because of my sin. I deserve to be separated from an eternal God. And when I die, there's only two places to go. A wonderful place called heaven or an awful place called hell. I deserve hell because I am not perfect, because I'm not righteous, because I've sinned, because I violated God's law. I deserve to be separated out, but God didn't want me to be separated out. So he needed to find some way to pay this wage, to pay this payment. So Jesus Christ, who was God, robed himself in flesh and came on this earth and dwelt among us. He lived the same life that you and I lived, went through the same temptations, the same troubles, and the same heartbreaks. And then he died on the cross to pay for your sins and to pay for mine. He died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and then rose again the third day to prove that he was God and to show that God was satisfied with the payment. Now, all that is left is that I must accept that promise that God gave me. Now, what does the promise entail? First of all, that God will forgive me of my sins. That's present tense. But with it, he has also provided me to have fellowship with God forever, not just on this earth, but in heaven forever. To prove that God was serious about his promise that I was going to live with him forever. God gave us the Holy Spirit who comes to indwell in us. In John chapter 3, it talks about verily, verily, you must be born again. When Jesus told that to Nicodemus, Nicodemus scratched his old silver head and said, I don't get it. It's not like I crawl back into mom. And Jesus explained that you have to have two births. And just as real as your first birth was, your second birth is just as real. What happens in that second birth? The Holy Spirit, who was God, comes to live inside of me and I become a new creature. We'll see that tonight. I become a different person. I now have the Holy Spirit infused in me and you cannot separate my soul from his spirit. So therefore, when I die, the Holy Spirit returns back to God. And because it's infused with my soul, guess what? It's going with it. Amen. Now, I'm using that as a stretched out illustration for something that's a little bit more spiritual to try to give us an understanding. God gives us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells within us as proof and evidence that Jesus is going to carry out the rest of his promise, which is that we get to indwell with him. The Holy Spirit is evidence that God is going to keep his promise. By the way, if you don't have evidence of that Holy Spirit in your life, you are not one of his. First John gives five birthmarks of the believer. Now I say that because you could know for sure that you're going to heaven because of the spirit living in you. And if you don't have those birthmarks, you are not saved. You said, well, you're being mean. No, I'm trying to be real to you so you can get saved. I have never told someone that they're not saved to their face because I'm being mean. Every time I've told them that you're not saved, it's because they need to get it fixed. Does that make sense? I'm trying to be pointed with them because sometimes people don't take hits. So you have to point and say, you're not saved. Fix it. Now, (laughs) why? Why am I doing this? Because heaven is a wonderful place and to dwell with God forever is wonderful. And it's necessary and we get to be with him forever. So notice if you don't mind. So we started off by understanding this dissolving tabernacle. This is going to fall apart one day. It's going to go away and I'm going to die. Which now brings us to a second thing. A new look at death. 
a new look at death. A different way of looking at it. Notice if you don't mind in verse number 6. Therefore, so because of everything we just told you in the previous verses, therefore, we are always confident. Knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, while you're living in here, you're away from where living with God for eternity. Amen. Not just simple things. While you're here, you're not in heaven. We can't be at two places at once. Amen. So while you're here, you're here. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Now, why is that important? Because none of us have physically seen Jesus. None of us have physically seen heaven. We have to believe those things by faith, not by sight. But that faith is that belief. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him or faithed him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're believing in something we do not see. Now that doesn't mean we have blind faith. We have faith that has evidence, faith that is true, but we have all accepted Christ without ever meeting him in person. None of us shook Jesus' hand. If you shook Jesus' hand, you've got some other issues going on. None of us have seen Jesus in person. None of us have seen heaven in person. I don't care what dream or experience you had of a bright life. None of you have seen heaven in person. Oh, I know. We believe all of those things by faith based off of what God gave to us in his word. That's the only thing we know about heaven and forgiveness is based off of his word. We believe it by faith. God told us and we believe it. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. You know what this means? That one day we're going to be out of here. We are going to leave this body and be immediately present with the Lord. That means we leave our physical bodies. We're not lost in a state of limbo. We're not in a purgatory. As soon as we die, if you've accepted Christ as your savior, you're with him. Amen. I'm thankful that there's no pit stops. I don't care what the cartoons say. There's no line outside the gates of heaven trying to check you. God knows who is his. You immediately are with him and he says, welcome home. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. I'm glad there's no checking my records. I don't care what the cartoons say and what all the TV shows say. The Bible says, as soon as I die, the next breath I'm up in heaven. D.L. Moody once said that he says, one day you're going to see in the papers of Chicago that D.L. Moody is dead. He said, don't you believe it? He said, I'll be more alive at that time than I've ever been before. Amen. That one day I'll take my last breath and the next moment I'm with him in the Lord. No pit stops, no intermarries, no bypasses, bypasses. I'm immediately with Amen. the Lord. That's a new way of death, isn't it? Yeah. Now, none of us want to go through the process of dying. I don't know anyone says, you know what? I can't wait to, to go through that process. But we should not be afraid of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfortest me. We don't have to be afraid of death as Christians because we know that absent from the body is present from the Lord. That one day I'm going to take my last breath and I'll be out of here. Now the process is what none of us are looking forward to. But if we're close to the Lord, God gives us grace even there in that time. And I'm thankful for God's grace. Remember, God's grace doesn't take away our pain. He gives us the ability to live with it and endure it beyond our ability. And God gives us a dying grace. There is a difference between a Christian dying and a lost person dying. That's a different message. But for us, it's a new way of looking at it. I don't have to be afraid of death. Now, why do I say that? Because there are so many people who do not know Jesus as their savior. They're scared to death of death. I know people who are afraid to close their eyes every night because they're afraid of what would happen if they don't wake up. I know people that are fearful. What would happen if I die? What happens if I get a disease? What happens if I get in a car accident? What happens if I get cancer? What happens if this happens? What hap and they live their life in such an anxiety 
with anxiety, with worry, with fret. And they can't enjoy the present because they're so fearful. What would happen to me if I die? So much they, they may not say it, but their actions. Let me tell you, if that's you, let me tell you the greatest thing that can happen is for you to sh- let me take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can know without a doubt your sins are forgiven and that you can be guaranteed from the Bible, a home from heaven. And imagine those fears going away where people can go to sleep at night. They no longer have to worry what would happen to them if they were to die. To have that settled and to have that secured is one of the greatest things that we can have. A new look at death. Which now brings us to our last thing. The judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Now, when we do die... We are waiting for an event called the rapture. And immediately after the rapture, there is an important event in world history called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is only for a specific group of people. Those who have trusted Christ as their savior. Some people will give a remark that, well, when I die, I'm going to let God judge me. You know, there's two different judgments. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, you're going to the white throne judgment, which is a thousand years later. You're at the wrong line. You're at the wrong judgment. And it's too late to switch. The judgment seat of Christ are those who have accepted Christ as their Savior before they died. So there's two judgments. You're, it's not like the cartoons say or the religion says where you show up and they judge you and say so you go to heaven or hell. When you die, you're already immediately in the right line. Amen. You're either at the judgment seat of Christ Or you're going to be facing God at the white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ are for Christians. And we will not be judged for our sins. Because Jesus already took care of that at the cross of Calvary. What will be judged for? Well notice with me if you don't mind in verse number 9. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 9. Notice we have the transition word wherefore. Wherefore we labor that whether be present or absent we may be accepted of him. Wherefore we labor that be in present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now notice this. This is talking about our labor being acceptable to him. We are not going to be judged for our sins that's been taken care of at the cross of Calvary. We are going to be judged on our behalf of what we did for the Lord and our motives. Paul already took care of this in more detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now he is following back up and reminding that the, everyone who accepted Christ, we're going to stand before God for our labor. And we must labor knowing that we're trying to please him. Notice verse 10. For we must all. Notice that word all. Class, what does the word all mean? All. For we must all appear. There's no exceptions. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now pause. Let's plug in some things. We learned things about the millennial kingdom, but let's cover this passage. When we die, we're immediately absent from the body, but we do not have our permanent body. Does it make sense? We do not get our permanent body until the rapture and immediately at the rapture, we have the judgment seat of Christ. Make sense? Why do we not get our brand new body as soon as we die? That's a good question. The reason why is because of the judgment seat of Christ. According to the Bible in many passages, we have a whole message on it in our Millennial Kingdom series, but let me just summarize that part of this judgment that you receive will show up in your physical redeemed body. And the reason why it waits is because of the judgment seat of Christ. You could see the rewards physically in your body. The Bible says that those who were great soul winners and used of God to see people come to know the Lord, their bodies are going to shine. And that it'd be in degrees, like different stars have different degrees and magnitudes of light. Some of us who are used to the Lord are going to be different degrees and magnitudes of light. That also means there are going to be some people who did not labor for the Lord, did not use their time wisely, did not have the right motive. They're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and get a brand new body, but it's not going to shine. And that's going to be their brand new body. 
And that means for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom, those who are born on earth, and there's going to be people born on earth during the millennial kingdom, they'll be able to look at you and say, hey, I got to, oh, never mind. I need to ask someone who's servant of the Lord, not someone who's in darkness, someone who wasn't trusted, someone who couldn't be. You know, those people who have shine in their body and the brand new redeemed body that others can see, they're going to say, I know I could go to them because they're trusted of God and God has put them in a position. And it's going to be evident in their body. Now that's an interesting twist, isn't it? Why is it that we wait to get our permanent body? Because of the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to stand before God and the things done in our body. And notice again, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he done, whether good or bad. So while you were in this temporary frame, you're going to be judged for everything you did for the Lord, both good and bad. You're going to be judged for your motive. Now the Bible gives all kinds of further details. This is what it gives here. Now with it, may I also tell you that there are different rewards we could win. The Bible names five specific crowns that we could win. If you don't mind, may I just quickly summarize the crowns that we could win? Notice if you don't mind, <laughs> we have first of all the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. We could find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. The incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. The incorruptible crown is a crown given to those who demonstrate temperance or moderate, uh, moderation, living a disciplined life. Let me give an example. If I was going to run a race as a uh, marathon runner, I'm not going to eat ice cream the day before. Is it illegal to eat ice cream? No, not at all. But I choose not to in order to run the race that I run. Well, Jesus has given us all a race to run. And there are certain things that we could do. It's not sinful, but we choose not to in order to be more effective in the race that God has given us to do. Does that make sense? Those deal with our standards. Those deal with some of the, the applications we make in our life so we could run the race correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, and if I do that with my life and have a disciplined life, then I ha can receive an incorruptible crown. There's a crown of rejoicing, a crown of rejoicing. First Thessalonians 2.19. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, the crown of rejoicing. These are awarded to those who make disciples. Not just leading people to the Lord, but also raising them up to the nurture and admonition of the Lord, raising them up to serve the Lord. Ye are my rejoicing, Paul had told this church, these people who are now discipled and following after the Lord. There's the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4.18, 2 Timothy 4.18, the crown of righteousness. This is a crown for those who love and eager, eagerly await the coming of God. You know, when you realize Jesus could come back anytime soon, it should change your behavior. Why? Because if he could come at any time, I don't want him to catch me doing things I'm not supposed to. I choose to look out for him. And because of that, it changes my motive. I choose not to do this because I don't want to be caught doing it. It changes what I do because he could come at any time, at any moment. Then there's the crown of life. That's James uh, 1 12 and Revelation 2 10 the crown of life James 1 12 and Revelation 2 10 the crown of life this is often called the martyr's crown this is the crown for those who died for the cause of Christ and those who endure temptations and trials faithfully we know that many of us will not have to die for our faith well, that's because we're also living in a land of freedom but that's not true and if I remember correctly, the year 2017, more people died for the cause of Christ than any single year in all of history. We have relative freedom, but those across the world, there's, they have a choice. Do you go to church or you do die? Remember in places like Uzbekistan, if you're found with an Uzbek Bible, that's three years in prison immediately. If you have more than 10 people in one place, it's an illegal meeting, three years of prison Imagine that. We don't have to pay anything for our faith. And so it's not 
hard for us to be faithful. But there are many people that face that challenge and God gives them a special crown for those who are willing to suffer and die in order to be pleasing to God. There's a special crown for them, the crown of life. There's also a fifth crown mentioned. That's the crown of glory. The crown of glory. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 4. The crown of glory. This is the crown for those who shepherd or pastor others. Who faithfully tend to the flock of God. And I'm thankful that God does give a shepherd's crown. This special crown of glory to try to pastor, to try to encourage people to follow after God, to point them to the Lord, to help them mature and grow. There's a special crown for that. Good. Sorry. So in in here, notice back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. It says, knowing therefore, so because of this, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Why do we have the terror of the Lord? Because all judgment is terrifying. Nobody wants to be judged. But this is such a big judgment to stand before God and give an account of all of my life. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Notice this. We persuade men. Notice what's the reaction. Knowing the terror of the Lord, you'd almost think it would say, because I know the terror of the Lord, I'm going to behave myself. Knowing the terror of the Lord, I'm going to go to church. Knowing the terror, but notice what it says. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What does this mean? This is soul winning. That because I know the judgment is real, because I know that absent from the body is present from the Lord, knowing that those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're going somewhere else. Knowing all of this, I persuade men. Because this is one of the big things we're being judged for. Did we witness to others? Did we tell others? Did we do our best to convince them to point to God? Knowing this, I'm going to stand before God and give an account. My response is I persuade others. I try to tell them more about the Lord. I try to be more effective of reaching people. This is my responsibility. This is my response. If I'm looking at God and the judgment and understanding what he's looking for, I persuade men. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust are also made manifest in your own consciences. This is a very big deal. To be able to say this is my motivation. Knowing that standing before God is a serious thing. It's not just showing up at a cashier line at the end of life and just paying for what I have. But knowing I have to stand before God and he's going to say you did well or you didn't do well. Knowing that it's going to show up in my body, my physical body, that's a big deal. And knowing that my big responsibility here and now is to try to tell as many people about the Lord as possible and help train others to do the same. This is the one thing that God has given us to do is accomplish the Great Commission. Knowing that this is the standard, this is the thing. It's not how many homeless I fed. It's not how many blankets I passed out. It's not how much money I necessarily gave. Did I do this to tell more people about the Lord and train others to do the same thing so more people can get saved? This is the main thing that the Lord is looking to do is to be obedient to his clear commands. So with this, we know, we can know for sure that we're going to heaven. Not because of sight, but because we could trust God's word. We know that this is a temporary body. And it's just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Even next to a thousand year reign of Christ. If I live 80 years, 100 years, that's only a small portion of a thousand years. That I need to be living for eternity, not for now. I need to make sure that I know for sure that I know Jesus my Savior. Then what do I do with the time that I have left? It is temporary. I don't have a lot of time. I need to use it for the Lord, persuading men and telling them about Jesus, putting my life for this one goal, knowing I have to stand before him and he's going to judge my life. Was I obedient to him or not? This is a big deal, a very big deal. The more that I study the millennial kingdom, the more I'm convinced my job as a pastor is to help prepare people for this one day. To help prepare people, not just for salvation, but to prepare them to meet their God in this judgment. 
that Jesus can look and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. To try to do everything we can for them to have a good judgment that day. Remember, he's not going to cast you into hell because you did nothing. But I'd hate to show up and do nothing for him when everyone else has done so much. It should be a reflection of my love for him. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. This judgment is a big deal. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God, a God who's worthy to be worshiped and worthy to be served. And as we come to you, Lord, I'm asking that you would give us grace and mercy beyond our comprehension, that you would draw people to you and that let people realize how serious this really is. Lord, I'm asking that someone out here, maybe they've never taken the Christian life seriously. That today that you would get a hold of their heart and that you would draw them close. Maybe there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their personal savior. Let them have the courage and bravery to come see me and I'd be glad to show them from the Bible without a doubt how they can know for sure. In just a moment, we're going to have what's called an invitation. There's nothing magical about these altars, but we're inviting you to respond Maybe there's some adjustments you need to make. Maybe there's something you need to change in your thinking. Or maybe there's something you need to adjust in your actions, your behavior. But knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you wouldn't mind to stand to your feet. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.